Hello everybody, Darren here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the game Hammerting, which released recently into early access on the 27th of October on Steam. Hammerting is a dwarf colony management game developed by Warpstone Studios, which I believe is their first game, and it's published by Team17, who publish games like Hell Let Loose and Overcooked. So today we're just going to jump straight into a brand new game where I can kind of establish the premise, some of the early game concepts, and some of the early content you can expect to see in the early access version. I've been playing the game for about 10 or 15 hours now. I do have a save we'll jump into a little later in the video to kind of show you the expansiveness you can expect to see in that kind of 10 to 15 hour time frame, as well as some of the content you can expect to see in the mid to late game of the early access version. Alright, here we are. Welcome to the mountain. You control a colony of dwarves aiming to establish themselves in the mountain and to support their faction in the great war raging on the overworld. So the reason I think that this game is worth covering and the fact that I think it's got a few unique things going on within it is mainly to do with this overworld mechanic. I think it's quite cool. So there's our little dwarves. They've arrived now. We've got a... The game is 3D. It is side on view, just like I said, like oxygen not included. And there's quite a large expansive map that we can get to, like I said, a little later on with my other save. So it's a procedurally generated cave system that you kind of come across. You can also do weekly challenges where everybody gets the same cave. And you can kind of see who does the best out of that if you wanted to. But I would say it's more about the single player sandbox nature of just having your own cave and expanding out. So let's check out this overworld map and establish the premise of the game. So on the overworld we have here, essentially we are fighting for the League of Methus and we're against the Dread Horde. So there's two factions with 23 points of interest across this map. And these different points of interest will give you quests asking you for weapons and items and resources and materials that you can get from the Mountain Home Mountain. I don't need to say Mountain after Mountain Home, do I? So once you establish yourself and you get up and running with a quarry and a smelter and a foundry and things like that, you can start forging weapons, shipping them out to the different places so that they can defend themselves when they get attacked. And they do get attacked. And you'll need to also launch your own attacks through the castle. Now you don't decide where the attacks go, they decide for you, but if you supply them with the goods they need in time, they'll typically win their battles or defend successfully. Now there's actually a decent amount of lore written about each of these points of interest. I think it's quite cool, especially for an early access game to have already established a little bit of lore here on the map. It's just kind of nice to read through. This game is a bit more of a chilled out game, I would say, than something like Oxygen Not Included, where you're constantly using up oxygen all the time in that game and you're very much against the clock. In this game, not so much. There is a little bit of a threat, obviously, for trying to make sure you're producing enough to defend. But I think at the moment, the way the game is balanced, it's easy enough in the beginning especially. So you can take the time to kind of read around. I suppose you can also just pause it as well. So for instance, here at Gramford Bridge, we have a bridge beyond, which is one of the quests, which is requiring 10 granite chunks. And then it's going to give us back some food, some lumber, some coin, and some trade lore. So we'll just take that quest on right now. And of course, there's actually a nice little paragraph, again, written about the quest specifically, saying that they want to repair the bridge, and that's why they need stone to do so. So obviously, some of these are preset events and quests that are written for specific locations and things like that. You start off with the same few every time to get you kind of up and running. But later on, you do get more generic auto-generated ones or repeat uh, kind of events that ask you to kind of defend this area for this reason and they need this amount of things. So it's not always unique, but it's pretty nice when it is. I think it just adds that little bit of flavor. All right, we'll accept that mission and we'll come back down now. So we've accepted the mission. So we're basically going to get up and running with the granite chunks. So let's start off with the quests themselves. We've just done that. Let's have a look at the dwarfs themselves. So I've just got a little bit of a list to go through so I don't get too rambly here and there, which I'm known to do when I'm off script. But essentially, let's take a look at the dwarves themselves really quickly. One little complaint I have, and we'll talk about issues a little later on, is I just don't think they look very good as dwarves. I actually think the game does look pretty nice, especially when you see this filled out a little later. And I think there's nice artwork and things like that, but the dwarves themselves are a, bit, a little bit lacking, I would say. And their animations are quite over the top. Uh, not that this has to be super realistic or anything, but even so, you'll see it when you see it. It's just, it looks a little low quality, in my opinion. All right, so we have Karlung Bragdamark, and essentially he's got his own attributes, he's got his own professions that he's good at, he has his health, his energy, morale, greed, 
and his own traits. So the cool thing here is they've got their traits, they've got their attributes, they carry different weapons, and they're good at different things, right? So this game is a quality management game like Oxygen Not Included. You don't control any one dwarf. Instead, you set tasks for them to do. So if I was to say, I want them to go mine this out, we can then open up the job broker and we can just see from here, this is counted as excavation. That's why it's highlighted yellow. They've all decided to go and do that. And uh, this person here, Jurdis or Gerdis, isn't particularly good at mining. So we can tell them, you know what? We don't ever want you on excavation. Just don't ever do that. You're not that good at it. And then instead, we can set him a different location. Like, you know what? You can go out that way. So because he's the one who's not doing the mining, we'll just make sure that is him. Yes, it is. He's going to be then heading out this way and doing some exploration. So the exploration aspect of the game is important because it actually feeds you back technology points in the form of what's called mountain lore. So as you build out and follow out these new areas here, you should really just get the hotkey for this. What is it? M. Okay. So as we kind of expand out, you can hear those noises triggering every now and then. That means we're getting new mountain lore. We have 10 right now. There we go. Don't know if we can get down there, can we? We might not be able to get back up thinking about it. Alright, oh, we actually had a little bit of combat there. What is it? A sly fox. Oh, God. Alright, so you get the idea. We basically queue up items, and then while in the meantime, we are kind of excavating over here, which is all good. So we want to build our first room and get stuff up and running and talk about building and crafting and how all of that works. So we'll just start with the basic quarry, which is the first thing... Everyone kind of builds. And that's going to require just a little bit of granite. And then it's just going to be basically put into place straight away. It's one of the very earliest buildings. It doesn't require that much. And it basically lets us harvest stone. Uh, just kind of out of the depth of the mountain, if you know what I mean. We're not harvesting down. We're harvesting into the mountain. Uh, so that's kind of where you get a lot of your resources from buildings like this. You can get resources by digging straight down, and then obviously in the walls you can see these glimmering, shimmering shines of copper and coal and other kind of materials that we want to be able to get later. That looks like we were able to climb. So, you can it's hard for me to gauge actually how much you can climb, but it does seem to be about five or so tiles. They will jump and climb their way up, but if it's obviously too, too big of a gap, they're going to need scaffolding and things like that. So that was our little bit of exploration. Alright, so... That's the job system in a nutshell. That's the exploration system as well, or just how the technology works. But let's show you what you get with technology. So in the arcane lore, we have two different technology resources. Mountain lore, which we just got by just exploring around really quickly. And then trade lore, which we get from completing some of the quests. So one of the first quests that we have was a bridge beyond. And in return, we're going to get five trade lore. And that trade lore is going to be what we can use to then get something like formalized learning, medicine, blacksmithing, whatever these other ones are, they all require a bit of trade lore. Actually, sorry, dwarven trade relations right here requires trade lore as well. So we've got enough to get metallurgy, we've got enough to get subterranean farming, and then we need to complete our quest if we want to get dwarven trade relations. And we actually need that before we can go on and get other things. So while we're building this building out here, we can start expanding out here. Every now and then you're also going to find occasional items and lore and different things dotted around the map so we just found an, a dilapidated trade card so we could rubbish through that we've actually got an idle worker as well right now we're waiting on two blocks of granite one is on the way what's being pulled out from the far right uh, right so let's just keep going and ultimately honestly we we'll need to just excavate all this out anyway so we'll just get doing that now there's mushrooms here which can be harvested we could use that for food later so again, if you've seen Oxygen Not Included, you're going to be very familiar with what this type of game is. So we're after picking up that granite. And that should get the building finished. Now once this building is finished, we can start getting our dwarves to work the building kind of indefinitely. And also then refine their skills and make them better at it. We can actually see that Jurdis has already ranked up. Uh, we'll deal with that in just one second. We just want this building to finish here first. All right, so there we go. So we'll harvest these mushrooms, which are kind of blocking the way as well. Now in here, this is our first building. It's a quarry, a small quarry, and we can get granite chunks. So you just click that, you go craft. Uh, we need to craft, what did we need? We needed 10, right? So we'll start crafting 10 of those. Now, we could also then start to see, well, what does this building require? It's a stonemason. So initially, when I first played the game, I thought like, oh yeah, this must be mining and stuff. It's really, really small to see. 
but it is requiring a stonemason as a job. So these are all the different jobs as we would have seen earlier. It's not that many, but there's enough to have a lot of different specializations. So stone masonry, the best person for the job would either be Gullick or Carlung. So again, Juridus, we're gonna take you off that and it'll shift around and put the best person it can on or the person who's available. The excavation is being done by Gullick because he's on 93 excavation. And then Carlung is gonna take the stone masonry. He's on 47. And we can improve this later anyway. And we'll keep using the other one to do the exploration and also do hauling, even moving things from one place to another is a job in and of itself. Hauling is the most primary and basic job, uh, and it's always good to get someone who's good at that because they can take more stuff to more places faster. And it's all about moving things around, actually, this game, really, when it comes to it. Because when you start expanding out to have a really big colony, it's all about the time it takes to get things together. You might need something that's really far down in the depths. You might not have that much time to do it, so you'll need kind of ladders and scaffolding and uh, pulley systems to kind of bring you back up and get your goods out to this chest and that's where everything goes before it gets shipped out so that's where we need to bring things so for instance that, that 10 granite that we're kind of harvesting in here it's gonna have to be brought along to that chest and then sent out so that's basically and you can just see you're getting XP all the time in fact one of my issues which we'll talk about later is you kind of get too much XP I almost wonder or feel like would it not be better to just get good at the things they do rather than because you can basically put points into anything if we were to do our first upgrade here for Jurdis, Jurdis was the one that was going around and exploring we could increase their awareness and their militia skill is actually pretty high as well so we'll increase their awareness a little bit increase their robustness and we can see that's going to give increased hauling capacity exploration production cooking production etc so on and so forth so we'll just do that for now agree to that and you could just store it up if you want and spend all the points into just one category later if you want to. Each category you spend stuff in gets more and more expensive over time. So the initial uh, granite chunks that we're after making have been stored in here. So we need someone to get hauling them. Which is actually a little bit weird that... Yeah, okay, good. One of them was idle for a second, but they're both doing it now. They're both heading back. I'm gonna pick up that stuff. Bring it to the chest and just load that up five times and get cracking on the rest of the excavation here and then we can go explore and find more stuff so there's for instance coal yeah let's get mining this as well and then let's just queue up this stuff to be rummaged and then we can just advance time and speed things up a bit there's all these different things here old, old barrels so we'll just speed it up and there we go all that stuff has been mined great and then what we're going to be building next is a forge. So here we go. Our bridge beyond is ready for delivery. And we'll complete that. And that just instantly brings us back the food and the money and so on and so forth. So you might be wondering, what does money do? And, you know, why do you need food? And so on and so forth, right? So we have energy, health, energy, morale, and greed. Energy is going to be basically requiring stuff like uh, water, food, going to the tavern, having snacks and things like that. Morale is also going to be having beer, ale, and also water and other things as well. Greed is going to be getting paid. Now, greed just kind of falls down over time, and then they'll go and just take money from your treasury, and that counts as them getting their wages. So you always need to have money in the treasury so that you can pay your dwarves and make sure their greed stays happy. If greed falls down, morale falls down, and then energy falls down, and then their health falls down, they get knocked unconscious, basically. So... They're all linked to each other, so even if you're just constantly supplying energy, eventually energy will fall if you're not supplying the others. Uh, unless you're really giving them a load, but it wouldn't be very efficient to do that. Alright, so that's the situation. We also have then a bunch of different missions, just generally for an ancient omen is the overall arching, the overarching quest that you have to do, which is kind of finding out what's going on about the mountain in general. You have to go pretty far to find that one. And then there's other stuff like setting up your own cave farm and mining copper ore and so on and so forth. I keep saying so on and so forth. Can't help it. All right, accept an overworld mission. So we might have another one, do we? We do. We have one at Fall Docks now. So Fall Docks are requiring two beams. And they're going to give us 20 to 30 coin and two trade lore. Now, because we finished that last quest, we've got the five trade lore we need. We can now do dwarven trade relations. And we can start to set up little bunk beds and places for us to live. It's one of our new things, our dwellings. So we'll start digging deep. And to do that, we'll just start going down this way and building scaffolding. So that's going to take a while to be excavated. Can we do the other buildings like forging yet? Yes, we can. We've got a foundry. So that's what we want to get up and running next. 
Now, what you can also do by taking on more quests and getting more money, you can start to recruit new dwarves. So I think we could get another one. Hilmer. Helvi. Or Alaric. Um, we'll just go with the cheapest one for now. There we go. Actually, we could get two. Yeah, let's do that. Alright, so we're after getting two more dwarves that are just coming to the fold right now. And I am just speeding through things so I can hopefully show you guys as many features as possible in a short amount of time. So, whenever you... Basically, what would be a good idea now is to just always have someone cranking out the chunks. And then certain buildings like this are going to be requiring blocks of granite. So, for instance, now we have more recipes. A block of granite is going to be two granite chunks. And you can see how this would obviously expand and get more complicated then when we start actually getting metals, like copper. Then we make copper ingots, and then we make other things from that, and things can be combined together to be more complex and more interesting as well. So we're digging down, but I'm also building scaffolding as I go down. Looks like we're about to hit another area down here. For now, I think we might... Yeah, maybe I'll load up the next save and go a bit further and show you where things get to later on. All right, so welcome to a bit more of an advanced look at the game now. We're about 8 to 10 hours in. I'd say just about broaching the mid-game of the game here. And you could probably do this a bit quicker if you uh, knew what you were doing or being a bit more efficient. But this was one of my first saves. Uh, I've just only got six dwarfs, so not that many. Uh, clearly, I wasn't focusing on it. If you see the other save where we already had five, the fact that I've only got one more, it's a little bit embarrassing, I'm not going to lie. But uh, I wasn't really focusing on money too much. I was kind of more interested in the different systems and how everything was working rather than actually really advancing that much. But in the tech tree, we've actually gone ahead and got pretty much everything, almost everything, not everything just yet, but gone all the way down to tier seven, got the adamantine, heavy metal, mithril, orichalcum, I think it's called, and platinum. Haven't found any of that, but we have the technology to now smelt it if we do find it and we want to kind of uh, refine it to make some more advanced items and weapons and things like that. So, for instance, one of the quests that I actually have to do right now is fairly relatively complicated. It's a, a rad banquet, and it's going to require pancakes, jelly cake, lichen soup, boar, bacon, brochettes. Uh, so, this all stuff is done in a kind of a cookhouse here where you can make all these more complicated items. And the, a lot of agricultural items, if you're going to be the one cooking the food, it's going to come externally, most of it. Some of it you can get inside, like algae. So there's different biomes in the caves themselves, and we have kind of an algae cave out this way. And then down south, we have our frozen caves. These could be in different places, it just happens to be in the south where we found it right now. And we also have then an abandoned graveyard. So you're going to find these kind of in these kind of buildings that are already built into the map occasionally from time to time. We have here a bleeding atrium. We have uh, a jackpot mine. This one's really interesting, actually. This jackpot mine, you can basically send dwarves into it, and based on the supply there, you'll get random items back out. It's a jackpot dig. It's actually quite cool. That supply goes down, and then it actually builds back up. It doesn't quite make sense for mining items, I guess, but that is what it does. Another one that does kind of make more sense is the Sacred Well. So this is kind of like an infinite supply of water that you can just get based on its supply. You harvest as much as you can, and then eventually the supply will fill back up, and you can go back down and get more. So there are some... It's worth exploring the map to find these different places and find unique items and buildings and enemy types. Like the skeletons, as far as I know, only come out of the abandoned graveyard, and that's the only place I could find to get bones. And bones is really necessary to kind of get that bone ash and fertilizer and things like that. We're just getting to the point now where we're expanding enough where transportation is starting to be the major blocker in time and it's becoming more about how do we get around the map and ship goods up quick enough to deal with our quests rather than, you know, dealing with everything in this area. So I've just started to get the first pulley system up and running and we want to be able to move down there so we just hop onto the elevator. It takes us around pretty quick but you can imagine obviously with the size of the place that you're going to need many of these, and you can get sideways ones as well, mine carts that will go from left to right, deeper into the caves, but I haven't built one of those just yet. Alright, so that is pretty much everything for Hammerting as it stands so far. So to go into some feedback, uh, you know, one of the most notable things for me is just the animations. I think they really don't look very good. You don't often spend that long zoomed in on them anyway. You know, you'll often play on a fast speed, you'll stay zoomed out, and I think the buildings actually do look good, but it's just... I don't know, they just don't look like dwarves even when they're not animated, and when they do get animated, they're like so over the top and sped up, it's just really strange. So I feel like, you know, the game's missing a bit of a trick there with, with having real personality for the actual dwarves themselves. Like, their images and their artwork here, I think, look pretty good. But just in terms of when you're actually, like, looking at them, they don't look the best. Now, that's not to be said the same for the buildings. I think the buildings actually look pretty great, and they're animated quite nicely. They're quite distinct. What a building does is quite obvious and easy to figure out once you've kind of place it down yourself, you get pretty familiar with where things are quite quickly. 
Uh, so I think generally the atmosphere of the game is actually pretty cool and pretty good. And uh, I like the different biomes and the different lighting that's associated with the different biomes. It really gives a clear distinction of where you are in the caves and things like that. Uh, for the job system, the job system is kind of facing a real problem right now, I would say, and that's kind of like the, your main interface to the game, and I imagine the more people you have, the more tedious this is going to get. Uh, games like Oxygen Not Included have largely figured this kind of thing out, but any task that can be done needs to be able to be listed in this job system. For instance, movement and combat just aren't even here. So, you, if you want to prioritize going down and fighting some of those skeletons, for instance, what would often happen would be I would set an attack marker, on some of the uh, skeletons to be attacked and one person would just come down on their own and there was no way I could get multiple people to come down to do it because there's no job I couldn't like turn off their other jobs and tell them hey focus on this so what I ended up having to do is wait until everything else was done give them no tasks and then send them all down together so it's just a bit tedious a bit arduous stuff like that can be really annoying now you might have already noticed it from uh, listening to the video but music in the game is really repetitive as well. I think it is actually one long song on repeat. It's probably like a 10 minute song that just repeats itself. So it's not the best. And that again, really hurts atmosphere. I ended up putting on the Deep Rock Galactic soundtrack when I was playing. Game was like 10 times better immediately just from doing that. So that was quite good. And the very last thing I wanted to touch on again is kind of more of a pet peeve thing, which is farming. They get you to do a lot of farming in the game so you can cook and bake and do different things internally. And I just don't think it's a great mechanic for a game set inside of a mountain with dwarves. I, I mean, me personally, I don't really associate them with farming that much. And you do end up having to do a lot. I had to build like four farms out here because you have fecund fecundity, basically how fertile the farm is. And uh, when you're uh, craft, it says craft, when you're kind of growing things, your fertilization goes down and then you just have to wait for it to come back up so you end up just building loads of farms to do it more quickly and it's just i don't know it's not the most balanced system i would much prefer if you had to work with the overworld all the time to get stuff back uh, and here's an example by the way of one of the combat uh, the impending attack so they need machine parts to fight off this pending attack small force is appending at this location we have the opportunity to assist the league of methods so in this current save, I'm actually losing, and they might lose that town. That would mean that we'd lose some access to things we normally get from here. And if they end up pushing on the Lumberjack, we're, we're screwed, essentially. So it's quite cool. I think there's a lot of great potential up here for potentially doing trade with different towns, providing different goods, having price, fluctu price fluctuations based on what is the supply and demand of different goods is, and if they're under attack, what they need, and if they're at peace, what they need. I think that would be really, really fun and great. Um... And that's why I just see a lot of potential for this game in the future. So I think it's just one to keep an eye on. And stuff like the... Like I said, me personally, job system needs a bit of an imp improvement. I don't necessarily think farming really has a place in a game like this. I think it would be much more interesting to have more and more interesting ore and complexity in terms of forging and runes and magic and things like that. I think it would be quite cool uh, in a game like this. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. I know it's a little bit more off the cuff, a little bit more rambly, but I think it's kind of interesting to just see the game being played and give you an idea of what's going on. Honestly, I wouldn't have had the time to do a long form video on this anyway, so hopefully you felt it was worth having a look at in the end. And uh, let me know in the comments what you think of the game. I know a lot of people are quite sick of early access games, and I, I kind of am too. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out when a game has a good idea or it seems to be doing something kind of interesting. I'm not saying that people need to go out and buy this, but just keep it on your radar for future updates and I'll revisit the game if people think it's something worth revisiting. Uh, I certainly had a lot of fun with it so far and I kind of, it, it is just a satisfying, chilled out kind of colony builder. All right, thank you guys very much for watching. Let me know what you thought of this kind of more loose form, off the cuff video and I'll catch you in the next one.